the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. We have what was the end of the first central bank and the second central bank here in America as a result of populism and distrust of government. I wonder how the general public responds to the next crisis. That's where most agencies see their opportunity to intervene and ratchet to an even more significant role, never to cede that role in the future. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You know, looking back at governments and uh, societies through time, we have elected governments and then we have tyrannical governments, but oftentimes we have unelected governments and it's usually in the form of military. These days, Dave, it seems it's not the military that's made the coup here in America, but actually the unelected power of the central bank itself, the Federal Reserve. Last week, you said it was costing us $183 per person per day for this $60 billion insertion that is being called not QE. I don't remember voting for that. Well, no, there's so many things that we don't vote for anymore and are not really represented in terms of, you know, who is putting it in motion. Are they are represented elected officials or not? So there's two veins of thought on my mind presently. One relates to the markets. We've had a number of multiple Hindenburg omens in the last few weeks. And, you know, the divergences we spoke of in the marketplace with declining volumes, even as prices increase, a number of things that are on my mind in that regard. But also towards this sort of tendency to delegate power in a democracy. And and again, this is, as you mentioned, the unelected officials. And I'm laboring through an, a nearly 600-page book by a retired central banker and self-acknowledged technocrat who now teaches at Harvard. I guess that's where all good technocrats go after they've <laughs> spent some time uh, <laughs> out there in the working world. I guess you know, before we get too far into our our conversation today, Kevin, we could have probably had last week's comments on stuffed turkey, our uh, uh, Nassim Taleb reference. Maybe that would be better suited for this week, at least for our North American audience. So happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you who are in the Mm. habit of gathering and spending time together as a family this week uh, or wherever you may be. I hope that the wine flows as well as the conversation and that tryptophan brings you great rest. (laughs) Well, and truly, we do have so many things. We have so many things to be thankful for. And uh, I think it's important that we do focus on that which we truly should be thankful for. But, you know, going back to what we were talking about here, you know, obviously, there is some control that needs to be maintained. Not everything is going to be electable. But we have seen military coups in the past where everyone who was elected got thrown out. Now, in this particular case, like I brought up with the central bank, the Federal Reserve, and actually, if we were to look around the world, Europe is definitely like this as well. You have people who were very, very powerful in the room, and you could say, well, gosh, who made you boss? Right. Yeah, and it's pretty ordinary to have delegated power in some places. So, for instance, you mentioned the military. That's fairly common. That's power that is not elected. You rise in the ranks. It's a merit-based process. And the accountability is generally to, well, at least it's structured here in the United States, to the commander-in-chief, that is the president. And actually, this country was designed to have some unelected power that would be uh, a balance. Looking at the judiciary, our judges in our legal system, they're not elected necessarily, but uh, they do exercise one-third of the power. That's right. So here you have a group of people who are outside of any sort of political volatility or supposed to be. And, you know, as long as they're not legislating from the bench, so to say. Uh, But we have that unelected power in the judiciary. Judges are appointed, not elected. Mm. There's reasons for that uh, being, you know, very core to our governmental system. And obviously at the local level, we do elect judges. But as you move on up, the Supreme Court is not elected. It's appointed. Well, today we even have sort of an unofficial fourth branch uh, or arm of government, and that's the central bank. And that's that's the primary point of interest for me. That's where my interest lies here when I think about unelected power. 
U.S. history, I think, is helpful here. We have our central bank, which came into existence through a unique set of circumstances, and it actually preceded what became sort of a more common, and again, if you go back, there was a very, very common period where we had sort of an explosion of an alphabet soup of, you know, independent agencies. That's, you know, the New Deal and then all kinds of unelected power delegated to these independent agencies. Today, you've got things like the EPA or the SEC or the or the FTC, and that's kind of iterations that you see around. But the central bank was a pretty key one that got launched back in the early teen, 20th century, uh, about 1913. Yeah, so our country has changed. Is that the cost of empire, uh, where you start having less and less electable uh, government and more and more appointed government? Well, it certainly is a reflection of the sophistication and uh, the detailed involvement of government in in lots of aspects of our life. Uh, Delegation is sort of this process of, I have too much on my plate. We need a specialist who can take this on. So, you know, independent agencies and delegated power, one of the things that struck me recently were comments from a State Department official. Uh, This was in the recent impeachment inquiry. And the tone was fascinating. The tone Hmm. was as if the president's agenda in Europe was not the agenda of the State Department overseas. And, And I thought it was fascinating because not only does the president, that is the executive branch, appoint each of these country leagues, that is our ambassadors, but the agenda is set by each successive administration and is a unique agenda emanating directly from the executive branch. So this ambassador was expressing great disrespect and sort of a direct opposition to the Trump administration's goals and objectives, which I thought reflected a very technocratic attitude, this kind of attitude of we know better, we know better. And it reminded me that there is this class of unelected officials that can at times you know, be so close to the trees, they forget the forest. It's not that you can't have your own opinions. You can have your own views. But as a diplomat, you represent the country and you represent the president that appointed you. It reminds me of illumined leadership by an illumined few. You know, when you listen to people who are talking about something other than an elected government, they'll use the term illumined leadership by an illumined few. But that's not the government that we have in place. No, and and I am comfortable with, and I grant you, these are typically very qualified diplomats. They've studied, uh, whether they've studied or have direct experience in international relations in order to be familiar with a particular context. Um, But they arguably could be better qualified to represent our interests abroad than the president. But, and here's the critical point, the chain of command includes the executive branch and the priorities of each administration are expressed in practical terms through our diplomats overseas. So again, it it just was this idea that yes, we have delegated power, but you need to understand from where that power emanates. And there is the tendency amongst those who have been delegated power to almost forget who gave them the power in the first place and for whom they speak. And again, that's that, let's call it the temptation of the technocrat. It reminds me of what uh, you've talked about. A lot of our foreign policy is actually dictated not by the military or administrated by the military, but by the U.S. Treasury and how we control the flow of funds through SWIFT or just uh, access to the liquidity markets. Well, again, like we have our foreign policy And most people do think about that best expressed through the State Department. Uh, But you're right. And if you follow Juan Zarate's argument in his book, Treasury's War, that's really what you have in motion. My friend who was in Saudi Arabia working for the Treasury Department was actually appointed by Juan Zarate, again, back to appointments versus elected leadership, and played a very critical role in that country for a good seven-year period. And I think was probably more effective there in Saudi than the State Department. But the underlying issue here has been described by academics, has been described by practitioners. When you get into this diplomatic role or this appointed role of power as an independent agent or agency, you can be described as an overmighty citizen. Does that make Mm. sense? An overmighty citizen. And it sounds a little bit like if you go back to 1945, when George Orwell was writing his book, Animal Farm, 
all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal. And that's kind of the sense that I get. A technocrat sees themselves as a more equal animal. And, you know, when you see that, okay, you're talking about more equal than others. I think about people who work eight hours a day, five days a week for a certain amount of money. I mean, there's scarcity of money, a limited amount of money. And then you have another group of citizens. And again, you brought up the citizen, over mighty citizens, that can print money out of thin air to the tune of $183 per head per man, woman, and child in America every day to smooth out markets or whatever. Those are still just citizens, aren't they? They're not elected officials. This is a power that I haven't been asked if they could have. Yeah, you're referencing the QE4, which is in motion now with that $60 figure just divided by 327 million citizens here in the United States. Yeah, but it does give us a rough cost of what the current initiative is. There's other initiatives, and so there is more money involved. But these are people, these are people like you and me, they're citizens who really stand outside the normal legislative process. And in some instances, they create rules and laws which carry the same consequences if we ignore them as if they were legislators, as if they were Hmm. determining the law of the land. In other words, these are agencies which have the power to constrain, they have the power to coerce by a statute, by the rules that they create, as if they were elected, as if their rules or laws followed a normal legislative procedure. And here's the rub. This last aspect is not true. In the process of delegation, you have the executive, you have the legislative, you have the judicial branches. In the process of delegation, government has ceded power and has ceded authority to these overmighty citizens to do what they, the branches of government, were originally mandated to do by the framers of the Constitution. You know, again, two thirds of which were elected to representatives. Remember, the judges are not not elected at the highest level. So, you know, I think central banks fit this bill, and they are in that category of the overmighty citizen. You know, and I think as we explore in our commentary, a lot of the monetary policy critique that we have comes from the perspective of seeing a mandate, which was originally implemented 106 years ago, and that mandate continues to grow. It continues to creep beyond the original dictates of the Federal Reserve Act and facilitate what ultimately to us is destabilizing to the financial markets. Like we talked about last week with that Minsky instability thesis, again, where what is meant for good doesn't always end with good things. Well, many people would look back at the Revolutionary War and see a different reason for the war. But a big part of the war was a fight against the Bank of England, okay, the debt that uh, England had built up, that it was actually moving over to the citizens of this new colony system over in America. Uh, The Patriots, uh, a number of the Patriots, were vehemently against having a central bank here in America because of this overmighty citizen problem. Yeah. And just like we hear from the revolution, the the tagline, taxation without representation, uh, this is a point that's made over and over again in Paul Tucker's book, Unelected Power. You're talking about legislation without representation. Now, in the case of the Federal Reserve, in that instance, it was a very practical issue. You had problems of liquidity that emerged following the 1907 market panic. And there was a drain of liquidity from the New York financial markets to San Francisco. You might recall there was a a massive fire in San Francisco about that time. And the rebuilding of the city required a lot of liquidity. So it left bankers in New York scrambling for an improved means of managing liquidity. First, they came up with the Aldridge Vreeland Act, and that was kind of the first run at it that allowed them to create the National Monetary Commission. And then finally, a few years later, they had the Federal Reserve Act, which gave birth to the Federal Reserve, our central bank. And they had to sneak that in, if you recall. They snuck the Federal Reserve in on a Christmas holiday when there was just a few guys there to vote. Yeah, exactly. Um, Because 1911 legislation was put in place, but there was no political will to actually give birth to the Fed. There was a pretty big struggle there. And by 1913, they did get it done. But as you say, it narrowly passed. Most of the legislators 
who were slotted to vote against it had already headed home for Christmas. Both sides of the aisle were thinly represented. And, you know, it did. It created one of the great delegated powers in the 20th century here in America. Now, that's not the case if you want to go across the pond, the Bank of England, the Swedish Riksbank, both preceding our central bank. You know, they have a history back into the 17th century. And they had inspired Alexander Hamilton's views on central banking, on centralized control. He was kind of the boy from Nevis who was forever an Anglophile. He loved the Bank of England. And, <laughs> uh, you know, Bank of England is affectionately known as the old lady of Threadneedle Street. And he loved that old lady. And Andrew Jackson hated the same old lady of that street. So, you know, we had earlier iterations of central banks where they tried to get these things through and, and the populist movement or whatever you would have it. People just said no. That's right. And it, that's, that's precisely right. Andrew Jackson and, and kind of a, an expression of populism. We had earlier iterations of the Fed. We had two earlier central banks, both of which were allowed to go the way of the dodo bird because populism crushed them both. And in those earlier iterations, it became clear to voters that both the first and the second U.S. central banks were not adequately serving the common good or the greater good. And I think it's noteworthy that during periods of populism, there's greater scrutiny about what is considered essential to governance and what is considered excessive interference, uh, maybe even what is considered inappropriate in terms of, how should we say it, being one-sided in the benefits that it confers. And let's look at that, because the Federal Reserve, it's like anything else. You know, you start it small, and it grows and grows and grows. You know, these unelected, like you said, these citizens that have too much power, it grows to the point where you can't shrink it anymore. Originally, the Fed had two mandates, did it not? Yeah, that's right. Well, and to be precise, it was a one-mandate institution until 1977, when that second mandate got added. And it was really because of a lot of conversation that started in the 1940s following the Employment Act, 1946. So 1913, in the case of the Fed, now we have two mandates. But as I say, the first one was price stability. Then 1977, maximum sustainable employment became the second mandate. Uh, and they amended the Federal Reserve Act to include that there in the 70s. And they can use any monetary policies to get those things done, price stability and maximum sustainable employment. Now, today, following the global financial crisis, there's blurred lines. There's blurred lines between monetary policy and fiscal policy. You've got debt commitments and the price of debt being established by the Fed. And you really can't hardly tell who's who between the Treasury and the Fed in terms of the, the roles that they originally played. Um, but the Fed mandates have now expanded. They've expanded to banking supervision. And again, following the global financial crisis, we have macro prudential financial system management. And the macro prudential piece, again, it's just this migration. Slowly but surely, the idea of price stability, and that too has sort of morphed over time. It once was just consumer prices, that is the inflation question, and that was the focus. And now it's not just consumer prices, but in terms of quote unquote price stability, it's as if they've adopted asset price stability or market management as an unofficial mandate. Well, and that's why the stock market is so completely comfortable with the Fed having their back, because at this point, the Fed has turned that into their own mandate. That's right. So now the financial market question about price stability in many respects, is being ruled by the Fed. And it pertains not to the currency stability as originally understood back in 1913, but with stabilization of asset prices, kind of like the Greenspan put. And as you suggested, Kevin, it's just something that underscores confidence among speculators who ultimately feel like there's only upside, no downside, because the Fed's got their backs in terms of asset price Stability. It amazes me that we have slowly accepted the fact 
that our dollar can lose two, three percent of its buying power a year. And that's good. That's a good thing. That's uh, inflation stability. I mean, I would think and we've talked about this before. Zero is the number we should really be shooting for. It would be nice if our currency could actually hold a buying power. And now we're told that they're working to a 2% inflation rate. Uh, That's what their goal is, is to have the dollar lose 2% of its buying power per year. And they tell us that's a good thing. Well, and it comes back to something very basic. What are they managing? If they're managing price stability, what are they managing? Is it a number? Is it an ideal? Or pragmatically, are they managing us because there's now this general acceptance of inflation targeting that is anything but consistent with the original idea of price stability but as long as inflation remains below the liminal level that is what some people have called subliminal that is the range at, at which we as ordinary citizens cannot or do not detect it and maybe it's that you know we don't understand it because we can certainly detect it. You and I know when there's inflation, but what they're trying to do is twist the understanding of inflation such that we no longer have concerns. And if we don't have concerns, then our behavior doesn't change and they can get away with doing what they do, managing an inflation target as a part of that quote unquote price stability mandate. What are they managing? They're managing us. They're managing us when they jump around from CPI to core inflation to chained versus unchained to PPI to PCE. These are all measures of inflation. And by the end of the, this litany of measures, you say to yourself, I, I, don't, I don't know, what are they even talking about? Well, yeah, they're continually managing perception by confusing us. I mean, let's face it. They're trying to confuse the audience, saying, again, this this goes back to the who made you boss. I don't remember electing you. I don't remember voting for you. And what they're saying is, we're the experts. Trust us. Right. So acceptable inflation is not zero. It's not less than zero. You know, 19th century, we actually had periods of huge economic growth and a deflationary contracting uh, you know, a monetary contraction in play. It's really now today is any positive number that the Fed can get away with. It's any number that does not negatively impact consumer behavior. And keep the stocks rising, right? You said price inflation. Keep the stocks rising. If they're raising asset prices and continue to hold that, and everyone knows that the Fed has their back, they're probably more likely to accept a little bit of an inflation or even a little bit of uh, instability in other areas as long as their 401k looks like it's going to make money thanks to the Fed. That's right. So that's that conflation or confusion of what price stability means. At the same time, asset price inflation has been melded into that Fed's mandate for price stability. And the implication of financial market instability which comes when you have the opposite. You know, here's the key. This is really what, what I'm what I'm getting at. When you promote economic growth via credit growth, which is our current addiction, you must by necessity become more sensitive to asset prices because any decline in asset prices upsets the apple cart. And again, mm-hmm. what's the context we have here? We've got an over leveraged world where you can no longer afford to have oscillating prices. You've got the overleveraged individual, the corporation, the bank, even government, the balance sheet issues, where when assets shrink, if you have asset prices shrink relative to liabilities, you've got big, big problems. So now all of a sudden, when you look at what the Fed has become in terms of managing, quote unquote, macro prudential issues, macro prudential management, really what we're talking about is controlling the business cycle, smoothing it, and becoming more and more pro-cyclical with their policy choices. And then you could even describe it as their mode of operation or credo as extend and pretend. You know, we were talking about elected officials, but, you know, we do have an elected official who is asking for some of that money. And Trump had tweeted that he wanted to see negative interest rates. He wanted to see the Fed loosen up quite a bit. And we're seeing that now in asset price rises in the stock market. You know, we're above 28000 on the Dow. So obviously, the Dow loves having a little bit more of that money. Oh, absolutely. So there are these broad issues of governance. We have rules and we have responsibilities, which are not a part of the original legal framework, but pragmatically have become a part of the activities 
of this independent agency we know as, as the Fed. And today it feels a little bit like central bankers are almost like the zookeepers of the credit world. You got to feed the beast. Uh, you got to feed the Leviathan. You keep them fed. You keep them healthy. You keep them happy. You know, in the old Hebrew texts, you know, the, the Old Testament, Leviathan is seen as a chaos monster, large, undefeatable, and ultimately it brings chaos. Uh, just the very, very opposite of order and uh, a creator. It reminds me, Dave, do you remember uh, someone that we've both read and actually had on the uh, commentary, Robert Higgs? When he wrote the book Crisis and Leviathan, one of his main points was this Leviathan just continues to grow. It doesn't really shrink. No, that's right. I, I think that's a must read for anyone who has not seen it. Robert Higgs, Crisis and Leviathan. I think it was Cambridge University Press, if I recall correctly. And it, he's not covering the issue of delegated power to unelected overmighty citizens. That's not his point. What he's recounting is the ratchet process, the ratchet process whereby the backdrop for greater intervention and involvement by government, and in this case, government-created agencies, it springs to life in the midst of crisis and very rarely recedes when the crisis is passed. So thus, mm. with, with each successive period of stress and strain, uh, kind of the cycles of life and of the markets and of things like that, you know what you end up with. You have larger government there, which remains even after they you know, were created to solve the temporary. Now you have the enduring issues of governance and control, even though the justification was, was just a kind of a temporary fix. So what was temporary becomes a part of the permanent framework, largely through the delegation of power to independent agencies. We need to get an expert in on this. What does the expert say? This isn't my area of expertise. I'm just a legislator. I'm just a this or that. What does the expert say? So, you know, our minds were open after the New Deal to a process for an even broader range of delegation to occur. But here today, we have the interplay between the, the capital markets, the credit markets, the scope of government, and now this facilitating role which central bankers play, which to me is just utterly fascinating. Well, I look at the Constitution, okay, if we go back 200 and almost 50 years and say, all right, at this point, the Constitution doesn't look the same way it did when it was written before. It actually, the Constitution was written so that these leviathans could be contained in a cage that they would have limited growth. At this point, it seems that the cage doors have been opened. Well, the heart of the issue from the standpoint of political science is whether such delegation is appropriate, if it's, if it's workable. If you go back to Madison, if you proceed in Montesquieu, you've got representative government, a balance of power, three parts of government. These are, again, elected, representative, under the rule of law. For us, that's the Constitution. Whether the issue of legitimacy remains in terms of mandates that are given, results that you see flowing from the operations of government, um, to me, this is really at the heart of, of this delegated issue, is can you even have a representative government when you've got laws that are being made that have nothing to do with elected officials? Well, and what's striking is this book that you're reading by Paul Tucker. Paul Tucker's a technocrat. I mean, he admits that himself. This is a guy who has been operating as a overmighty citizen himself. Now he's writing a, a book, 600 page book, saying, hey, this thing has probably overreached and now it needs to be controlled. Yeah, I mean, I get the sense when I read through Paul Tucker's book on elected power that as a veteran central banker from the Bank of England and the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland. And now he's working as a fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School, and he's the, the chair of systemic risk, the risk, systemic risk council. I think, I think he sees the overreach. Hmm. And I think he wants a well-defined role for the overmighty so that the roles are not ultimately eliminated or restructured back towards total obscurity. And there's a case to be made that our central bank community has gotten off the leash. And unless they voluntarily put themselves back on the leash with a well-defined contribution, with a clear mandate, the legitimacy of power they've been given, maybe even the power that they've taken, maybe that legitimacy comes into question. And his book is first and foremost an apology for unelected power, not a justification for delegated dictatorship. It's just an apology for a technocratic, 
contribution consistent, he believes, with democratic and representative government. But as I said earlier, this is where it gets really interesting. During periods of populism, there's greater scrutiny of what is considered essential, essential to government, governance, essential, or perhaps even what is considered excessive in terms of interference in the natural processes of, of, of the market economy, of banking, of human interaction. And Tucker, it would seem, would like to govern the discourse on the topic. And I think he raises some great points. And in the course of 550 pages, I wish it was a little shorter. <laughs> I <think he> could've... <laughs> well, I think it's striking, too, that this is coming from a European. I mean, Europe is is known for being run by technocrats. Uh, this is not a book being written by a U.S. citizen. This is a book that's being written by a man who is uh, not just critiquing uh, the Federal Reserve, but he's also looking uh, worldwide at this overreach. Right. So, I mean, Europe, if you look at its latest iteration there in Europe, You've got this vast technocratic non-representative government of administrative elites there in Brussels. If you look back at the history, there's a long history in the UK and in Germany and in France of technocratic administrators going back several centuries. So these are not new issues, but describing what is legitimate, what is not legitimate, what are the rules of the road, there are unique applications as the modern era chooses greater and greater professional specialization. You know, even look at our academics today, look at our educational system today. You're forced to specialize, choose one area where you know something, but then that leaves a broad array of other things where you don't know, and so you have to delegate. So we all delegate. We do this on a daily basis, a weekly basis, but our governments also delegate to experts. And so I think this is very appropriate in terms of a conversation. What are we delegating? Why are we delegating it? Uh, is it appropriate to delegate? And are there ways of maintaining accountability and transparency with these processes that are delegated? Well, and there would be some, and I would probably be included in this, that would say, well, just get rid of the Fed. Get rid of these guys. Let's just, let's start over. Let's go to, you know, real money where everybody's playing on the same type of playing field, whether it's backed by gold or some other commodity that there's equal access to, and but no one can print it out of thin air. That's what I would say. But I'm thinking probably from a practical standpoint, Tucker's writing this book to say, okay, that's probably not going to happen. What are the boundaries? You know, if we're going to have a central banking system, how far can they reach? Well, and exactly. That's why I think he wants to sort of define what is the discourse and do we understand the nuance so that we can continue to legitimize and justify why we have a technocracy today. And so what are the boundaries that ensure legitimacy for technocrats going forward? How do these agencies avoid political capture? where, you know, basically you have an alliance with a particular constituency and you're basically working for that constituency or or a deep seated alliance with a particular political party. And where, you know, in your role as head of an agency, you're basically like an ideological mafia and you get to operate as such. Right. But under the protection of the law. So that's a really important thing to recognize the role of a technocrat. And how do they do that and avoid political capture? And this comes to mind, particularly in the case of central banks. How do you avoid promoting moral hazard? This is a lot of the conversation that, you know, has, has led us to a series of crises. And I think we're getting closer and closer to the next one, again, where central banks have promoted a world of perfect peace and calm in the markets. And the unintended consequence is, again, going back to Minsky's instability thesis, the more stability they create, the greater the instability they ultimately create as well. And so the scale of stability today, also the mirror image of that is the scale of instability tomorrow. Does the legitimacy of government, and this is something that, that I think we also have in mind in the context of, of a free fall in the stock market or what have you, does the legitimacy of government ever come into question when you've got delegated power, for instance, the Federal Reserve? you know, sitting on a less than ideal outcome. I mean, the flip side of this, is this one of the reasons why politicians like delegating power? Because one of the key benefits for those that are elected is that it allows you to closely identify with successes and then scapegoat in the event of failure. It's not my fault. This is the person. We need to elect somebody who'll do a better job, et cetera, et cetera. And it always puts the politician on the side of the populace 
without having to take responsibility for failures. So in that sense, does delegation remove our ability as citizens to maintain that accountability structure with our elected officials? Well, and aren't we seeing that to a degree? Uh, because Trump uh, comes out and, you know, just vocally criticizes the Fed, and then two weeks later he'll come back out and he'll say, I love these guys. I love these guys. They're doing the right thing. And then he, you know, when, when he was uh, campaigning for a president, he was very concerned about the Federal Reserve, and now he's wondering why they're not giving more money. So there is a distance. Uh, he can distance himself and... Uh, continue to maintain uh, political credibility, so to speak. But can we say end the Fed or are we just too deep in this? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we have to go beyond that to adequately critique today's monetary policy. We cannot simply say end the Fed. It seems like a form of elegant solution in its brevity, but it's one thing to critique your interventionist monetary policy. And I think there's plenty of room for that. I think there's plenty of room for that, particularly in an era that has witnessed very unconventional policies in Europe and in America and around the globe. There is a broader context for unelected power and central banks that fit into that. And so when we look at what we have in the markets today, we're reminded of it. We see the fragile nature of our financial system when the repo markets have been essentially nationalized. Right. As we talked about last week, that the eleven and a half trillion dollars worth of cumulative interventions to keep the repo markets alive. But the bigger picture, the bigger picture is how we arrived at this delegation. We asked them to do this. This function is now normal to us. And what was the justification? And is it still justified, this sort of delegation in the first place? It goes back to, do you shrink the Leviathan, which it doesn't seem that you can. I mean, $4 trillion sounded incredibly large 10 or 11 years ago when we had the global financial crisis. Now you're talking $11.5 trillion. And, you know, we've got this QE going on again in a non-crisis period of time. You know, going go to these boundaries that uh, Tucker's talking about. Dave, we've had other central bankers on the show, and it's been incredibly enlightening. I'm just wondering if we shouldn't have Paul Tucker on and have him explain to us why why he wrote a 600-page book. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to discuss the quest for legitimacy in central banking and the, the quest for legitimacy in our regulatory state, and to be honest, it's not the most comfortable conversation for me, but it is an mm. important one. It's one with lots of nuance. And I, you know, I've got some things I'd love to share in, in terms of the markets, but this is a pretty quiet week for the financial markets uh, with the holidays. Anyway, so I'll just hold those for next week. It makes me think here we are at sort of the intersection of, of monetary policy and fiscal policy. And the central bank is being asked to kind of sit the fence and govern both to a degree, at least perform an enabling function where we can't afford what we're spending on the fiscal side. But that's not a problem because our central bank will make it all affordable. Right. So we have Medicare, right. Medicaid, Social Security, add defense spending and interest on the federal debt. And that adds up to 112 percent of our current federal tax receipts. In other words, we're spending more than we're making. I mean, let's face it, every household has to come up with how to spend less than what they bring in on a monthly basis. What you're saying is we're at 112% of what we're bringing in. So we need the Fed, right? The Fed will make it all better. And exactly. This is, this is where, again, the lines are obscured between monetary policy and fiscal policy, because on the one hand, the only way that we can make this work is through controlling the interest component. I mean, we were at 103%, those five budgetary line items, we were at 103% just 15 months ago. We were at 95% of total tax receipts two years ago. And if they can control interest rates or take them negative, then it all is, it works out. It's no big deal because the, the, the line item, the, the key variable line item, interest on the national debt can be managed to nothing. And so, I mean, again, what are we not including? We, we haven't included agency budgets. We haven't included the expense of running the government outside of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and defense, right? But that's 112% of tax receipts for only five line items. They're big ones. Mm -hmm. Yes, I grant you that. Does that argue for shrinking government back to what we can afford? Well, as a citizen, I might ask that and you might ask that. But if you're talking to someone in government, it's an absurdity, right? 
But to me, this this is how gold fits into the picture of delegated power, monetary policy, and those mandarins determining what is best for us and ultimately enabling, performing the enabling function through fiscal policy initiatives as well. This last week, the Financial Times ran an article, the title of which was Gold is Looking More and More Attractive. And the article details this point. Rising U.S. liabilities for entitlement could undermine the dollar. And I, I read that and I think, you think so? The answer to me is obvious. But how did we get here and where do we go from here? Power struggle. We have what was, you know, the end of the first central bank and the second central bank here in America as a result of populism. We have rising populism around the world a distrust of government to some degree when populism is in play. What does this look like for the financial markets? You have a massive power struggle. I wonder how the general public responds to the next crisis, where again, as Robert Higgs would argue, that's where most agencies see their opportunity to intervene and ratchet to an even more significant role, never to cede that role in the future. So if a listener is wondering whether this uh, system of paying more than what you're taking in will work, run by a crew of overmighty citizens, if a person's asking that question, does it work or not, they probably ought to hedge on the other side just in case it doesn't. And what you're saying is Financial Times even is thinking gold. <laughs> gold is looking more and more attractive, the article details. And that's the main point. U.S. liabilities and entitlements could undermine the dollar. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. We hope that you have a very happy Thanksgiving. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. And you can call us, other than Thursday or Friday of this week, at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.